welcome to the latest uh, episode, I guess, of Big Ideas Live. I'm Janet Nielsen. I'm your host, and I'm actually on site today. As if you uh, if you normally watch, you normally know that I'm uh, I'm in one screen and my guest is in another. But I'm actually at the University of Toronto Mississauga with our guest today, who's Professor Pierre Desrochers, who's a associate professor of geography here, um, and he's also uh, the co-author with his wife of this great book, The Locavore's Dilemma, and if you've been paying attention to my emails, you'll know that uh, by attending tonight, you are going to be entered in a draw to win one of five books. Um, and we're going to talk tonight about uh, whether or not we can feed the world, which I think is an important question. Um, so I guess we can get right into it. Uh, and I wanted to start off with a question that I learned from the book, which was, or not, it's not really a question, it was sort of a lesson that I learned, and I really liked, uh, I appreciated it in the book, was, when we're unhappy, people, a lot of people are unhappy with how we grow our food now, but uh, we, they kind of look at it as it is now and then say, well, we should go back to how it was. But they don't ask, why did we change things in the first place? And I think that's a good question to ask. Yes. So why don't we talk about why we grow our food the way we do now? Yeah, of course, no system is perfect and there are, there's always room for improvement. I mean, after all, uh, the most sensible definition of progress you can think of is creating lesser problems than those that yeah. existed before. And that's exactly what happened through the development of our, our modern food supply chain. Uh, people tend to forget that, you know, you don't need to go back uh, all that far in time, but two centuries ago before the advent of the railroad and uh, the uh, steamship, most of the food that people were eating was produced, not even within a hundred miles of where they live, but probably more something like 50 miles. And that's because uh, land transportation was so bad. So yes, if you lived in a coastal city, you could import cod from Newfoundland, but moving cereal grain over land was very difficult. So even for a city like Paris, all the way up to the early 19th century, most of the grain supply was really within 50 miles of uh, the city. But what happened then in the 19th century is that James Watt came along, the steam engine came along, and suddenly it became possible to move large quantities of food economically over long distances. And so increasingly what happened is that people discovered that growing certain types of food in certain locations just made more sense than trying to grow everything close to you. So people stopped producing most of their foods for themselves. They stopped producing a lot of different things rather inefficiently close to where they live. And they began to import food from uh, locations that had better growing conditions for certain types of food. Yeah, which is great. Um, I, that was, like, as I said, one of my favorite uh, lessons from the book. Um, and we're going to get a, a little bit into economics here uh, because something that I've noticed when people talk about local food is, for instance, in Canada, the push for local food often comes from somewhere like uh, British Columbia, where they can grow a lot of things. And in economics, there are two concepts called absolute advantage and comparative advantage. So BC, especially um, the, the more fertile part. The, the lower not, mainland. The, yeah, not, not, not up in the mountains. It's hard yes. to grow things in the mountain, but the lower mainland in BC, you can grow almost everything. And in somewhere like, say, uh, th sorry, we've gotten a little bit Canadian. We are in, we are in Well, uh, let's see Berkeley. In the United yeah. States, <laughs> a lot of it came from Berkeley, sorry. which is more close to the Central Valley of California right. and uh, the wine region of yeah, Napa Valley for, and others. So. For, for sure. Whereas if you've got somewhere like Montana or somewhere like uh, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, uh, I can almost guarantee that no one will ever get a box of strawberries that says grown in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, but I mean, maybe. But why did that, why, why did that yeah. happen? And I'm sure that, you know, <laughs> if you had gone back in time, maybe a hundred years ago, perhaps some people were growing strawberries in greenhouses in Moose Jaw. Mm -hmm. um, I have pictures that I use in some of my presentations of you know, people growing cucumber near Minneapolis, Minnesota. And people used to have actually huge greenhouses close to uh, large cities a century ago because it was the only way to uh, get fresh produce. I mean, you could ship things like, you know, dry cut, uh, wine, cereal grains over long distances. But before the advent of uh, modern preservation technologies, refrigerations, you actually had a lot of greenhouses around large cities, but eventually even those disappeared. And why was that? Well, think of it this way. Uh, there are, as uh, Janet was saying, both absolute and comparative advantages in growing food. So yes, uh, if we cross the border here, we're in Toronto, there is a botanical garden in uh, Buffalo that was built mm -hmm. about a century ago, and they have a banana tree in there. Right. So you can grow a banana in Buffalo, but why don't they grow more than just one banana? Or why, why don't they have more than one banana tree? Well, because it just doesn't make sense. Economically, you need to heat the greenhouse. Yeah. And this requires a lot of uh, natural gas or electricity or 
I mean, it's the, same, uh, the building is a century old, a lot of steam in that case. So it just happens that, you know, a location like Guatemala or Honduras just has better conditions to grow bananas. So this is basically what happened in North America. People stopped uh, producing things expensively in large greenhouses because they realized that, you know, uh, upstate New York, for example, might be good at growing apples, but uh, for growing citrus fruit, well, Florida just has the better climate. Yeah. And even if you look at orange production these days, a lot of people don't realize that Florida produces oranges mostly for juice and uh, processed food, whereas the oranges that you find in your supermarket will come from California. Yeah. Why is that? Well, California has a drier climate. They have less of a fungus problem. They can produce higher quality uh, products. So even within areas that can grow oranges, some are actually better than others uh, yeah. for, uh, for growing certain things. So this is really absolute uh, advantage. But then you've got this, no, you've got other cases where you could grow, where two regions, which will be at different levels of economic development, could grow the same type uh, of food. But in those cases, what happens is that, well, in some places, uh, labor uh, costs mm -hmm. or the jobs that people can get will either make it attractive to work in producing the types of crops that require a lot of labor, let's say produce, but in other regions of the world, people might have better opportunities. They might mm -hmm. be a bit better educated. They might be able to design software to produce other things. So in the case of comparative advantage, some people have simply um, a, uh, an, an advantage in specializing in certain things rather than others, even though they might, uh, on the surface of it, have the same type of agricultural conditions or physical geography conditions. Yeah, and some examples, uh, we were talking a little bit about this beforehand. Uh, we don't just dive into these things with you guys. We do talk about it beforehand. And so, some examples, uh, well, one that jumps to mind that we actually didn't talk about is coffee. Yes. Uh, this is one of the reasons that people are very concerned about trying to get a better a better deal for coffee farmers is because uh, coffee is extremely labor intensive. As far as I know, there that you just have to pick Well, up actually, no, no, there are two types oh, of there are coffee. Two types. There are two okay. types. There are Robusta and Arabica. Robusta is the kind of a cheap one that is that comes from Brazil, which is grown in flat plains, and you can actually mechanize, mechanize production. Oh, okay. But the higher quality stuff, the shade grown uh, on hills and stuff, is yeah. actually very labor intensive. Yeah, okay. And so, yes. Okay, so I used to work I used to work at a Starbucks, and so to them, all coffee must be uh, done yes. by hand, but they don't use Robusta beans. Yes. So, uh, yeah, and uh, another one that I, I, uh, I had to study at, in school was uh, snow peas in Guatemala. So you can probably grow snow peas just fine in California, but the, the um, American workers in California are probably not, you know, it's hard work to it's bend over and, and pick peas in the quantities that you would need to supply an American uh, for themselves. Yeah, and, and that's really what comparative advantage is about. It's about the relative cost rather than the absolute cost. So um, unfortunately, hopefully one day this changes, if you live on uh, kind of the, low, the lowland mountains in Guatemala, that's, you're not giving up that much to become a snow pea farmer. Um, there, you don't have that and many. You're actually other, improving your standard. Yeah, abilities. you don't have many other options. Whereas, if you were a snow pea farmer in California, you may be able to. You might be more efficient at growing snow peas than people in Guatemala, but you've got better. Yeah, you you can you can go work in a, in San Francisco, or you could start a startup like everyone else in California. Um, and so that's kind of that's kind of the point is. Um, by taking advantage of the relative costs, that's how we really make people better off. And um, why, in my opinion, at least, we should be a little bit less concerned about uh, when our when our th our food comes from poor farmers. The best way to improve things for them is to improve their their options. Let them, as long as they're free to do what they want, if they specialize in export crops, it's probably because it is the best option available yeah. to them. And again, our ancestors used to be subsistence farmers. They used to produce all their own food. At one point, they got out of farming or they specialize in one type of farming, they improve their standards of living that way and that's how everybody is better off. Consumers got more food at a more affordable price and paradoxically by specializing in export crops, uh, those poor farmers, even though they might not be paid much by North American standards, are still earning a better living than the options that would be available to them in the absence of the opportunity of exporting yeah. these foods. And even though they're not growing their own food, they have pretty constant access. But then, then they, now they have the money to yeah, buy food exactly. from people who are better than them at producing those other uh, types of food. Yeah, and so um, I think it's a really important lesson uh, to learn because it, it's, a, it's a little bit counterintuitive to think that 
you know, really California, they can grow a lot of food, so why do they only specialize it? Well, I mean, they actually grow a lot of kinds of food, but, yes. um, but they produce why do they specialize it all? Yeah. But California, for example, used to produce a lot of grain in the 19th century. Oh, interesting. But at one point in time, uh, the northern plains were open with the advent of the railroad, and so grain production shifted, I'm talking about wheat and, and you know, barley, things like that, shifted from California to places uh, like North and South Dakota. And what farmers did in uh, California, rather than going bankrupt, is that they began to grow citrus fruits and other things okay. for which their soil and their climate was better suited. And everybody was better off in the end. The farmers in the Dakotas were better at producing wheat. The farmers in California were better at producing citrus fruit. And in the end, both farmers could both get citrus fruit and wheat more cheaply than if the people in North Dakota had tried to grow citrus fruit in greenhouses right. and people in California to grow grain in an environment that was not as suitable as the Dakotas. Well, there is this notion that you can improve the lot of agricultural workers by paying them more uh, to produce essentially a lot, uh, the same product that they were that they would be trying to sell at the moment. Well, there are two things I believe that fair trade advocates do not understand. The first is that the best way to help agricultural workers is paradoxically to get them out of agriculture. Farmers in North America are wealthy because one percent of our population, one or two percent of our population, produces most of our food. So the best way to be kind of, to help a, an agricultural worker is to make him more productive, and uh, you know to give him more machinery and uh, more things to produce uh, what they do. But the thing is, w once you do that, you don't need a lot of workers. Mm -hmm. So the best way, paradoxically, to help a lot of migrant workers in less advanced economies is to provide them, you know, full-time, well-paid city jobs. Right. This is exactly what happened in a country like Canada or the United States. A century ago, about 40% of the population was still involved in farming. Most of them were very poor. And in time, though, better city jobs were created. The people who remained in the countryside became much more productive. This is why farmers today are relatively wealthy in North America. And, uh, and this is why we have a huge middle class, because people left the countryside to move to cities. The other problem with fair trade is that, I don't want to get into the technical details, but there is a huge ideological dimension behind it. So for example, uh, if you buy fair trade coffee, it must typically come from a producer's cooperative, mm -hmm. which will not allow, um, let's say for example, children to work. But the problem is that in less advanced economy, like used to be the case in Canada, the school year is often scheduled around the harvest period of the main crop. Right. So, for example, in Canada, Atlantic Canada used to produce a lot of potatoes, and the school year in Atlantic Canada was scheduled around the potato harvest, oh, meaning that the kids would be <laughs> off school when they were needed to harvest potatoes. Okay. And this is an income that the family really needs. This is why it was scheduled around. But uh, fair trade often prevents the, the employment of children, which provide a supplemental income for the family that they often need. But ultimately, the problem with fair trade is that it's basically built on charity. You're asked to uh, pay more for what is often a lesser quality product rather than let the best producers spontaneously emerge. And it's sad to say, but you don't build a thriving economy on charity. So what this country needs is uh, real economic development, better opportunities out of the countryside, and let the people who will remain in the countryside become more productive. Yeah. And this is how you will really help people through free trade and specialization in other lines of work. Yeah, uh, and we could easily talk for an hour about all of those questions, but um, if anybody has more, don't feel like you can't ask about fair trade just because I said that. Uh, but I do have another question um, from Phil. So he says, my friend says that the seller of an apple produced overseas and ships to America externalizes the cost of carbon dioxide emitted by transporting the apple. Can you comment on this? Yes, uh, well, it's typically not true. Uh, so Prices are not perfect in the agricultural sector because we've got production subsidies, we've got barriers to trade. But you've got to ask yourself, well, we can produce decent apples in North America. Why do we see apples from New Zealand, Chile, or South mm. Africa at certain times of the year? And as a geographer, I will tell you that the main reason is latitude. So <laughs> in, the northern atmosphere, in the northern hemisphere, we harvest our apples typically in September or October. You want to eat them in April or May, what do you do? Well, you need to put them in cold storage mm -hmm. and you know, high CO2 concentrations. There's a cost associated with that. Uh, you will have some losses due to spoilage. And so if you want to eat a North American apple in March or April, there's a huge uh, footprint associated with the storage and losses associated with storage. Now, if you, if you buy a New Zealand apple in March or April, what happens? Well, in the Southern Hemisphere, seasons are inverted. 
Uh, so, of course, in North America, we think of Christmas as occurring in winter, right? But you go to New Zealand, it's the middle of their yeah, summer. we do it all wrong. Exactly. <laughs> and so what happens if you import, if you buy a New Zealand apple in uh, March or April? Well, it was probably on the tree like 10 days before. Right. And so you don't have this huge footprint associated with storage. The argument that it's environmentally better. So there are a few reasons that people think this. They think, oh... Um, well, there's one reason, really. It's, transpor it's transportation. Transportation is a big one, yeah. And 95% of our transportation system is powered by fossil fuels. Yes. So it's, it's mostly, obviously... Uh, well, you know, diesel products, bunker fuels, um, and ships. And so uh, the idea is that, well, you know, you burn fossil fuels, you emit uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If you produce things closely, well, you don't need to move things over long distances, and therefore it is better for the environment. But the problem when you do that is that you, you forget why uh, historically agricultural productions began to move to other regions. And that's because transportation is only a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall environmental footprint of producing food. So, for example, when you produce food, well, you might need irrigation water. Mm -hmm. If you use uh, greenhouses, well, you might need natural gas to heat the greenhouse. Uh, you might need grow lights, not just for marijuana, but you know, <laughs> for all sorts of other things. If you have a short day, you yes, if you have a short day, you need grow that. lights, yeah. And so what happened in Europe, for example, is that, again, historically, people used to grow a lot of tomatoes in places like England in greenhouses. But what happened over time is that uh, the production naturally migrated along the uh, Mediterranean coast because now more irrigation water is available there and they have non-eaten greenhouses, which have the advantage of, of course, protecting the um, tomatoes from the elements, the wind and other things, but also of keeping more humidity uh, around the tomatoes. So they get tremendous yields along the Mediterranean coast and they need a lot less energy to produce a tomato than having uh, to build a heated greenhouse in a place like England. And so even though you might need to truck the tomatoes from Spain to England, uh, the amount of fuel that you burn doing that is much less than uh, the amount of uh, carbon fuels that you will need to heat your greenhouse year round, well, almost year round yeah. in England. So this is only uh, one aspect. If we're in Ontario, why don't we buy Ontario tomatoes? Because yes. a lot of tomatoes are grown in Ontario. Why don't we buy things here? And then we have farmers in Ontario, and farmers have a, a good job. And then they allegedly. will spend money, they will yeah, buy exactly. restaurants, and they will have baristas like you, <laughs> and they'll have more money for the barista. We'll then exactly. get a haircut, and they will then, you know. Exactly. Yes. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that you should buy food based on price and quality. Um, so if you always try to best, uh, to get the best deal that you get in terms of food, that leaves more money in your pocket to spend on other things. So the problem, well, look at it this way. Okay, we still do not import food from outer space as far as I know. I might be wrong on that. So good quality food will need to be produced somewhere. And obviously at certain times of the year, the best quality food will be produced close to where some people live. So at certain times of the year, it makes perfect sense to buy local food when it's in season. I mean, that's the best quality price ratio you can get. Go for it. I don't have a problem with that. The problem I have is when local food activists tell you, well, you should pay more for right. lesser quality in order to keep those inefficient farmers in business. Because again, if you, uh, if you keep them in business, then they will spend money locally and other people will benefit. But if you do that, if you pay more for less quality food, then you have less money to pay for other things. So suddenly you don't have the money to go to the movie theater if you still do that. Uh, you cannot, <laughs> uh, maybe you'll have to give up on a haircut. Right. Uh, maybe you won't be so generous when you tip the barista if yeah. you get instead of one Starbucks. <laughs> so that's the thing. Uh, you need to go beyond what is immediately visible. So if uh, local farmers uh, give you the best, you know, quality price ratio at certain time of the year, please, then you're creating real wealth. But if you're maintaining inefficient people in business, then no, it's a form of charity, which is not really charity because in the end, you're making everyone else better, uh, worse off. People have to remember that the uh, famine and malnutrition were defeated by one thing, long distance transportation. And that is because, think of it as edging your bets or spreading the risks of food production. The more you rely on people all over the place, the more it is likely that people in some regions will have very good years, you know, bumper crops, while other people elsewhere will have very terrible years. But if you can move a lot of food cheaply between locations, then people who have good year can help people who have bad years. But of course, a few years down the road, the people who had a terrible harvest might have a bumper crop, while people who had a good years might have a bad harvest. So uh, 
food security historically was achieved by spreading the risk and delocalizing essentially food production. I put a couple of uh, Freeman articles. The Freeman is a publication of uh, Fee, the Foundation of Economic Education. And it's uh, the first one is called Droughts, Famines, and Markets. And the second one is called Debunking the Shop Small Saturday Rationale. If you go to fee.org, which is our website, you can uh, just look them up and you'll find them very easily. If you have any questions about anything we talked about, about today or future events, uh, you can contact me. My email is on the screen there at jnielsen at fee.org. And I want to thank Pierre uh, for appearing with us today and talking about these important topics. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to let us know. But for now, we're going to sign off. Thanks, guys.